Welcome, everybody. I'm very pleased. My name is Amélie Canel Vallée, and I'm the director of Candy3. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this 2024 keynote address. Um, both those of you online, as well as those of you, the many of you in person, thanks for joining us. It's wonderful to see you. Um, so today we have, a, we will start, of course, with a keynote address on structural inequities in health, looking back and looking to the future. And um, just to give you, sorry, um, for those of you online, if you see me struggling, I'm just going to, there we go. Um, improve the visual for folks on, uh, in, in person. Um, and so giving you just a short overview of the day, we will have our annual keynote address, then a lunch and poster session. So unfortunately, those of you um, online will not be able to join us for that, but please join us back for the Dragon's Den's final. Um, then we will have a quick coffee break and poster session in the Partners and Fellow Showcase, again, um, back on for you all to join us online. I would be remiss if I didn't um, recognize the very many partners that make Candy3 possible. So first of all, of course, we are um, at McGill, and um, this is the institution that made this, uh, this partnership possible. The Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and of course, the many partners that you see on the left um, that make up the 38 partners that join us, um, both universities internationally and across Canada, as well as um, nonprofit, government, and private partners. Mais tout d'abord, um, j'aimerais reconnaître que l'Université McGill est sur un, un lieu qui a longtemps servi de lieu de rencontre et d'échange entre les diverses nations autochtones, incluant les nations Haudenosaunee et Anishinaabe. Et nous reconnaissons et remercions les divers peuples autochtones dont les pas ont marqué ce territoire et sur lesquels les peuples du monde entier, comme aujourd'hui, se réunissent maintenant. Les, the spirit of community and collaboration and coming together that is reflected in this territory is something that we wish to um, espouse and that we wish to recognize as a legacy here as we meet in, at Candy 3 especially, and of course um, today as we meet together especially given the topic that we will um, discuss today. Um, so first, give, let me give you a little bit of a note of introduction about our keynote speakers. So Dr. Uh, Dr. Mabel Carabali, sorry, get going there, um, earned her medical degree from the Université Libre de, in Colombia, a PhD in epidemiology from McGill University, and completed postdoctoral training at the Social Epidemiology Lab at the University of Toronto. She has served as assistant professor at the University of Montreal and has over 14 years of experience in international epidemiological and biomedical research. As a social and infectious disease epidemiologist, her research focuses on the effects of underreporting and misclassification in infectious diseases, socioeconomic exposures, and expanding statistical methods for intersectionality. Her projects include fever surveillance in Latin America, analyzing social determinants and disparities in urban settings in the Pan American region, and studying racial inequalities in police fatal encounters in the US. I was able to say epidemiology, but not police. Um, it's just sometimes hard for Francophones to put the right emphasis on the right syllable. I'm gonna try. Um, Dr. Caraballi is also an associate editor at PLOS Negle Neglected Tropical Diseases. Arjuman Siddiqui is a professor in Canada Research Chair in Population Health Equity at the Dalalana School of, Pub of Public Health, University of Toronto, and holds various appointments there. She is also a senior scientist and the Edwin S. H. Leong Chair of Child Policy Research at the Hospital for Sick, Ch Sick Tr Children in Toronto. Additionally, she has adjunct professorships at Harvard University and the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. Her research focuses on health inequities, particularly how social policies influence them. She collaborates with governments and international agencies on social determinants and international aid, oops, social determinants of health and health inequalities. She was a member of the WHO Commission on the Social Determinants of Health and won the 2022 CIHR IPPH Mid-Career Trailblazer Award. Dr. Siddiqui earned her doctorate at, in social epidemiology from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And we will be starting with Dr. Um, Arjuman Siddiqui, who is joining us remotely. And so I will just put this up 
here. Um, so I'm putting you up on the screen so that people can see your arguments and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Amelie. Uh, you know, first, many, many thanks to Amelie for always uh, thinking about me for uh, occasions like this and, and being able to be with all of you. Um, so I'm going to give what I hope is not too long a talk because I'd actually like to let uh, Mabel uh, go into more depth uh, than I will. So I've kind of taken the um, the the sort of perspective, the long perspective, the very kind of uh, bird's eye perspective on where I see the literature on structural conditions and health. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, I just started with this quote because I think it's uh, both very, uh, it's hard not to endorse it, but it's also very um, uh, problematic for us. So Nancy Krieger in 2011 says, analysis of causes of disease distribution requires attention to the political and economic structures, processes, and power relationships that produce societal patterns of health, disease, and well-being via shaping the conditions in which people live and work. That's a lot. That That's quite a bit to uh, tackle. Uh, next slide, please. So in my view, the literature has responded to that kind of orientation to health inequities in at least two phases, and I'm making the third phase up, or I'm at least suggesting we should have a third phase. So in the first phase of the literature, I think what we were primarily doing was not measuring particular structural conditions very much. We were primarily uh, measuring tendencies and orientations globally. So what kinds of social policies does one state compared to another tend to enact? Are they generous or not, et cetera? In the second phase, I think we got to a point where we were much more concentrated on measuring the effects of specific social policies. Um, and what I'm suggesting is that there might be a phase three that is kind of in our midst. Uh, and, and that really questions whether we should let go of phase one as quickly as I think we have. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks so much. Um, so this is just a graph of life expectancy between Canada and the US. And many of us have worked on uh, both overall population health and health inequity differences between the two countries. And I would say in the early to maybe the first decade of the 2000s, most of the literature um, sort of said, you know, looked at patterns like this and said, well, what are, are, are the possible reasons Canada might have um, higher life expectancy than the US? So that gap is about two plus years, and that's actually a pretty significant gap in life expectancy. And we would say things like, well, yes, it's healthcare. You can see that, uh, uh, you know, Canada has a universal healthcare uh, uh, policy and the US doesn't. But there are also these other social and economic differences that could lead to this, as we kind of know from social determinants of health uh, uh, frameworks. So Canada has lower income inequality. It has more generous social policies, et cetera, et cetera. And so we would we would sort of construct this na narrative that said, in many different ways, Canada is outpacing the US in terms of its social funding and in terms of um, measures that are reducing socioeconomic inequities and therefore improving um, health inequities and overall population health, at least in relative terms, relative to each other. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll just say quickly that, you know, this was kind of blown up uh, across many uh, countries as well. This is just a 
um, table from Gosta Esping Anderson's classification of a lot of the high income countries. He calls them the three worlds of welfare. There's liberal countries or liberal market economies, conservative ones, and social democratic states. And so again, a lot of scholars spent time kind of saying, well, what are the differences in health between these countries and sort of globally, um, what kinds of policies do they have that might correspond to these uh, health outcomes and differences in health outcomes? Next, next slide, please. So then we got to a very different era, which is one in which we moved away from these kinds of very descriptive orientations to saying, what can we say more specifically about particular aspects of, of policies and so on? Next slide, please. So this is a paper we did some time ago where we looked at uh, the, the range of methods that were being used to essentially uh, uh, measure the health effects of specific policies. And I would say the key distinction um, between that earlier descriptive phase is that in this phase, um, things like things like control groups were taken seriously. Alternative explanations, confounding was taken seriously. Um, in the previous sort of iteration of the literature, we weren't really thinking in terms of confounding. We were thinking in terms of what the broad narrative might be that sort of brought all a, a bunch of different factors together. Whereas now this was about isolating particular uh, policy uh, um, uh, issues. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So, um, one of the policies that's been uh, studied a lot, including by our group, uh, was the uh, Clinton era welfare reform in the mid 1990s in the US. And part of the reason this was studied a lot is that it really was a significant change in the resources available to low income people. Effectively, it decimated any semblance of a welfare policy, very much shrunk who was eligible for any income assistance and put all sorts of stipulations on to receiving income assistance. And so um, the that's one reason it's that it was really significant. The other reason people studied this a lot is because it really conformed to our, our new standards of being able to account for policy effects in this sort of stringent, isolated way, the way we account for other uh, phenomena, social, biological, et cetera. In other words, a very epidemiological orientation uh, to the question. And the reason it conformed to those standards is because it was quite a sudden policy change. It wasn't something that was diffuse. It was, you know, uh, it affected a particular group in a particular way. You could measure when it happened. You could measure what the amounts were that were associated with it, et cetera. It wasn't, you know, previously us saying, well, you know, Canada's got lower income inequality and it's this and it's that. Um, and so it turned out you could study these policy effects with quasi-experimental designs, meaning you could treat this just like an experiment. So there's a treatment group, there's a control group, you look at their health before and you look at their health after and you compare. Um, so we often call these models difference and differences and they're sort of offshoots of that method. But effectively, conceptually, the idea is that you treat the policy as some sort of um, an intervention and then you study how that intervention affected health differently in the people who got the intervention compared to those who didn't. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just, I'll say quickly, um, this is a on the left, a graph from, a figure from the study's results. And it effectively, you see like there's uh, triangles and squares. Those just represent different variations of the method we used. Um, and on the x-axis are different health outcomes. But effectively, 
our study showed that welfare reform was associated with a decline in a bunch of different health measures for uh, in particular low income single moms who were the most likely to be uh, welfare recipients to need welfare. So um, we were able to show that this policy change had this particular effect. Uh, and so I think what you could say is that I, our study did a really good job. Studies like this did a good job of measuring the effect of this policy in isolation. But it doesn't allow us to say anything about the fact that you know, there were people who were made ineligible for the policy at all and what happened to them. It doesn't gauge what the sort of broader context is even for low-income single moms. So it's different to say that welfare reform affected the health of single low-income single moms in this way with these particular metrics than it is to say, what are the kinds of socioeconomic conditions that affect the health of low-income single moms? which is less of this kind of pinpoint uh, question. Let's, next slide, please. Um, I think I'm gonna just go quickly through these, just fair warning. This is just another example um, from uh, uh, um, people uh, at University of Toronto in the Department of uh, Nutrition who took a different approach, a different methodological approach, but nonetheless, same story. How do you test the effect of a particular policy, in this case, the Canada Child Benefit, on a particular outcome, in this case, food insecurity? And their results showed, you know, a few percent decline in food insecurity associated with the Canada Child Benefit. So you can imagine this is important information that, you know, isolating the effect of a particular policy and having the evidence available to us to be able to say something about a particular policy can be very beneficial. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm gonna go past this one just for the sake of time, but this is um, a Manitoba prenatal benefit that also had the similar kind of quality of study design, and this is the um, effects they showed. So just one more after that, uh, next slide, and now next slide again, please. Okay, so um, I think we should think a little bit about this uh, orientation that we've developed to uh, testing the effects of specific social policies. Not because, again, that it's not valuable, but I worry that we're leaving behind some important perspectives and important questions when we only use one strategy and one orientation to causation um, uh, to understand what's happening in the world. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a graph of uh, health inequalities by income in the US on the left and, and Canada on the right. And the main punchline here is that health inequalities seem to be growing uh, in a lot of high income societies. You see this and, um, you know, this is after decades of, of us, even in policy terms, paying attention supposedly to health inequalities. We see that they are actually growing in many respects. Uh, next slide, please. So in my mind, um, uh, the, the, I don't know why I say socially constructed there, <laughs> please ignore that. But given that socioeconomic gradients are growing, my sense is that the important questions to ask are why are they growing? Why does this vary across societies? What has prevented our attention to social determinants of health from stopping this? And I think that these are big questions that have many interactive aspects. And I worry that when we only answer them in small, sliced, isolated ways, we do miss the broader story that is happening. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a, just one quick example that I'll give, which is the deaths of despair literature that's showing a rise in mortality from opioids, from suicide, and from alcohol use. And I'm just going to read quickly. Uh, this is uh, work from uh, Anne Case and Angus Deaton, uh, who are a team of economists and very, very empirical. 
Uh, and this is how they describe uh, this, this phenomenon. They say there are amorphous long-term forces that are at work. The fundamental tale is still the same. It's economic malaise. Trade and technological progress have snuffed out opportunities, but social changes are also in play. And they talk about unstable relationships and so on and so forth. And it's really fascinating. If you look at their work on depths of despair, I have, I think, yet to see them put a regression in place. And I think it's because, well, they're at the end of their career and they don't have to, um, but also because they don't think they can tell the story of what they think is happening in very specific terms. It's a broader set of factors that they think are operating. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, so this is the quote that I put up at the beginning, which is uh, Nancy Krieger's uh, uh, quote saying that, you know, understanding health and health inequalities requires that we attend to all of these things. And next slide, please. I found this uh, quote on Twitter. I don't know who this person is, but I was so struck by it. Uh, this person says, I'm worried about how well complex social and historical processes can be incorporated into regression models. Here you go. They can't be, except as unidimensional quantities. Think about all the work we make years of education do in, in epidemiology or race or anything else. The question is, what is the um, uh, uh, way in which we can answer Nancy Krieger's call, given the methodological orientation we have. And, and I don't know the answer to that, but I do think we should be in a phase where we're at least uh, questioning it. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. So please keep your questions. I'm sure there are many, uh, and we will come back to them um, at the full at the Q and A at the after the two presenters have given their talk. So now I'd like to invite Dr. Caravalli to join us to the stage. Thank you here so this should work. Yep. Thank you so much, Amelie, for the introduction. Hello everyone, good morning. Uh bonjour to Mont encore une fois. Um I think that we'll just continue our conversation from this morning. Um as I say, for me this is um, a great opportunity to talk about the work that we are going, that we are doing, including the work that I do with argument. Um, some thoughts that I have been um, having over the last years um, since I started working on, on, on inequalities. Um, so because it's the consortium on uh, analytics for data-driven decision-making, my conversation will focus on data. What do we do with the data that we have at hand? So I will skip the last acknowledgement, but um, it is important to, to recognize that McGill is located in a land um, which has long served as a site of community exchange among indigenous people, but at the same time that was established with the unpaid slave labor uh, of black and indigenous people at the same time. And then hence I, I honor and pay homage in this acknowledgement and understanding um, that as a newcomer to the land, I must support these communities and nations in their struggles and the colonization, for the colonization reparations land back in emancipation and healing while developing my own knowledge of this pain and trauma intergenerational. Few disclaimers. Um, yeah, so you already know I'm a physician, I'm a epidemiologist, I'm a McGill faculty. Um, I identify as a female, I'm black, first Latina after. Um, I'm Afro-Latina, Afro-Colombian, Black Canadian. I am an epidemiologist who works on quantitative data. I work a lot of methods, quantitative methods. So I'm not an activist, unfortunately. I don't have the capacity. I'm too shy for being an activist. So my views are just about empirical work and the quantitative research. And these disclaimers are very important because 
talk about how we inform data. I'm a section editor for Plus Neglected. I'm a guest editor for AJ, American Journal of Epidemiology, and um, guest editor for a special issue of social epidemiology at Social Sciences and Medicine. Um, other than that, I don't have any other conflicts of interest. Um, as I say, I, I will try to continue this conversation from this morning. Um, the idea is to look back and to think about the future, right? Um, the first question that we have to ask ourselves is, have we learned from the past? If you recall from arguments, considerations, we have like these three phases from the literature. Uh, but in her third phase, we went back to the first one, you know, like, what are we going to do? What do we want to know? So um, I'll try to go through several questions, um, provide some critical questions about the hows. I mean, what are we doing and how are we doing what we think we are doing with the special case for racial and ethnic inequalities. Um, I'll try to present um, some ideas about how to use the data for the future. So the first question is, what do we actually know? I will not spend too much time here because we all know about the concepts. What is the structural in that inequality, right? So we have this conceptual framework from the WHO that indicates that the structural determinants of health include governance, macroethics, social uh, policies, public policies, which are uh, our interests, cultural and societal values, but we have education, occupation, socioeconomic position, and more others. Other things that we know are those concepts. And I want to clarify those concepts because we often use it interchangeably and that's not the case. We talk about inequality, which is just a difference, a mere contrast. It's objective. There is a difference between measure A and measure B. That's an inequality. But when we talk about inequity, they were talking about value judgment. You know, what is just, what is fair? And that involves a little bit of subjectivity. Right? When we talk about inequalities, it's just five is different from three. But uh, when you talk about inequity, should five be different from three? That's the question that we pose. And then um, the idea when we work in public policies are not only on the inequalities, but also in the inequities. Unfortunately, most of us stays on the inequality. But coming back to the discussion this morning, it's more than politics, it's also logistics. What can we do? Because, you know, the value judgment is subjective, but can be subjective. So can we really intervene in things that are mostly subjective? That's another question. The next question about um, what we do in general is, what do we call evidence? Um, as I say, and they call it is just a contrast. It's a different. Um, what do we call evidence? And this morning we'll talk about how we communicate about those, those uh, results, those contrasts, those numbers that we obtain after our analysis. So there are several ways of identifying those differences and report them. We have, as I say, in epidemiology, risk ratios, risk differences, mm -hmm. at which our fractions, odds ratios, which are awful. I recommend everyone to not use them, especially if we are talking about inequalities. Um, but yeah, we have different measures of, of, um, of inequalities and then we tend to call them evidence. But is that an evidence of what? If you will remember this morning, we were talking about what are we trying to measure? That's the first question that we want to know, right? Like it's, it's really important to know what is the difference in terms of um, education, like how many years of education? What is that important? And to begin with, uh, we were talking about, you know, you talk about, you know, how many years of education, you're assuming that everyone has the same access to education to begin with. That poses us competing risk. You know, if you don't have access to education, how would you measure count how many years of education a person has? Um, and then we say, okay, so how we get that information, how we get that evidence? This is a joke. I'm, I'm not a qualitative researcher. I respect all the qualitative researchers because I think that they do a great job. Unfortunately, I am not able to. Um, but we, when we talk about this, where, where this evidence is coming from, 
uh, what are the questions that I am asking and um, who will be able to answer? We have to take into account also the logistics and the mind of the person asking the question. And in the case of um, inequality, it's very interesting, right? Because uh, we want numbers, because decision makers want numbers. Right? It could be too expensive, it could take too long, and people may say, you know, it's too tedious. Qualitative will say, let's have a focus group, but maybe those in the quantitative uh, side will say, you know, maybe people will not take us seriously. So what do we do at the end? We end up having the data that is at hand, the data that is easily accessible, regardless of whether or not it's of quality. So at the end, how do we obtain the data? Well, it depends on who's asking uh, the question, uh, what is the purpose, and what are we really wanting to, to measure. In terms of um, the question of how do we communicate or disseminate that evidence, we all write papers that nobody reads. That's the truth. And more importantly, there is also an issue of publication, power, and patronage. So there are politics, there are power dynamics into academic publishing that um, is increasing the inequality or the disparities in both access and distribution of the information. So nobody reads our papers, nobody reads our reports, but also do you think that the decision makers will have open access or illimited access to all the academic journals? Maybe not. On top of that, we know that there are dynamics in academia that make difficult that certain people, people with intersecting um, identities will get published in uh, the so-called like a high impact journals. So we came to this brilliant idea of open access, but open access without open publication creates even more biases, especially for people in the global south. And on top of that, we have also racial inequalities in journals. Um, we have uh, gender identities in colleges. So we have a huge issue, um, not only in the way that we get the information, how we interpret the information, but also how we disseminate that information. I think that was one of the greatest questions that we have this morning. So that's why I say this is more of a continuation of, of the conversation that we have this morning. As I say, I will um, share with you some critical questions about those hows, you know, how we obtain information about how we disseminate that information. Um, I go back, you know, looking back because we could not move forward if we don't know the history or the story of um, um, our given case. Um, so in addition of the question, critical questions and the opportunity or not to have answers, we have measures. Unfortunately, there had been decades of work where we pose the same question. And I'm making this specific case of racial inequality. We continue seeing the gap in relative terms, in absolute terms, we have the same questions. We have some answers. We have evidence that shows that, you know, effect of racism in health. So when we ask the question, how would you classify race? There is no a right answer because maybe what I don't want to ask is about race, but the effect of race. So access to education. Um, if you are asking about access to education or years of education, and then you include your variable race, what are you trying to get at? Why a black person have a different um, number of years of education versus a person who's not even black. And, or you are more interested in knowing why, or what is the effect of that lack of access of education? Or are you considering in the first place that a person may have a differential access to education? What could be those biological effects of that stress-related uh, racism? So as I say, we have the same questions. We have been asking the same questions for so many years. But we still have the same answers. Um, we may have different measures or different interpretations of the measure, but we still have the same answers. And um, to illustrate that, um, I like to present always this, this schematic. Everything is about context. 
So on the one hand, we have Sir Michael Marmot, known for everyone about social determinants of health and the health gap, where he says, you know, we have a gap in access to healthcare that is due to social determinants. But as this brilliant guy say, Damon Jer, what doesn't kill you makes you black. So people like me have a different resistance. Um, but I will say everything is about context. So one of my uh, field of research is infectious diseases, vector-borne diseases. And I would like to plug here the mosquito. I work on mosquito-borne diseases. Mosquitoes are supposed to be colorblind and pocket blind. Still, we have those diseases among people at the bottom of the socioeconomic condition and among black people, people of color. Unfortunately, we could plug in any cancer, maternal mortality, whatever outcome that we want, we could plug it in and then we'll have the same gap and we will have the same outcomes for black people and for people at the bottom of the socioeconomic um, distribution. So if we have the same questions, if we have similar answers and we have different, maybe different measures with the same conclusion, um, what are we doing wrong? You know, people say if you keep doing the same thing, expecting different results, that is something that is not uh, fitting. Well, we need to think about what is that context that we are looking at. Um, I like to think in the context of data, specifically for this audience, is that our context is our data, right? Um, why it is important for us to know our data and to know our context? Because ultimately in epidemiology or in research, we know that have a real world and that our research um, is trying to get measures to get an information of what's happening in the real world. What is important because if my research and my data is biased, if my data doesn't have representativeness, um, I will just be magnifying whatever mistakes is represented in this data. Another issue that we have to account with the data, in addition to the context, is data volume and data quality. And when I talk about the data volume, I'm not talking only about these 15 people in the focus group or these 500 people in the census data. I'm talking about our sample. How much data do I need to really get a really robust result? We may end up with data that is just too little, that we are not able to see any difference even if they exist, or we end up with too much data where we will see trivial differences that we call statistically significant differences, but that are not meaningful at all. So how much is enough? We don't know, but the important thing is just trying to get the information about the context and the representativity. The next issue that we have is data quality. And as I said before, and I like, to present myself as an example. When we talk about data quality and we talk about racial, racial inequalities, we need to think about why I am collecting the data and what I'm going to do with this data. I identify myself as the result from many um, interactions in, in terms of race and ethnicity but I identify myself as a black human being. However, I cannot deny my Native American indigenous ancestry, but it depends who gets the data about. And this is the case, a simple case when I was doing my PhD. I had an Argentinian friend, I have a friend from Minneapolis, and my best friend is from Paris. For each one of them, I was a different person. For my Argentinian friend, I was just a Colombian. For my Caucasian friends in North America, uh, you're Black and Latina because you're from Colombia. For my African friend, I was Latina. I couldn't be Black because I was not born in the continent. So that difference at the social context didn't matter. But I have a chronic condition. And then when I go to my rheumatologist, and my nephrologist, it depends. And it depends on who's the rheumatologist or how the nephrologist and what they note on the chart. Few of them have ever asked me how I identify myself. It is later when I see 
whether or not they multiply my glomerular filtration uh, function, which is a function of my kidney, um, whether or not they consider me black or not. How this is important? Well, if a physician considers me black, they multiply my glomerular filtration rate by a factor. And because I am a woman, they multiply by another factor. That impacts the decision at that point on how they will treat me, what medication they will give me. If the physician is Haitian, he will call me black. If he is uh, Southeast Asian, call me black. It depends if the physician has another ethnicity, whether or not I will be black. And in the one-to-one, -one, we say, okay, that's a cut, like much of an impact. But think about us. How many of us work with electronic health records? We all analyze this data. What are the decisions that are made with those electronic um, data? That's mean that I am over time. <laughs> so we say, okay, it's just one decision that the physician is doing to this person. It's not only that decision. It's the analysis that we are all doing with the RAMQ data, and it's the analysis and decisions that we are making at the Ministry of Health at the end by saying, okay, transplants are good or bad for people with this X glomerular filtration rate. And it's not only about glomerular filtration rate, it's about many other things. And you know, the definition or the observation depends on racism, discrimination, segregation, colorism, you know, because people may say, yeah, you're black, but not that black. And that may impact not only on the psyche of the physician, but my own and how I will be treated. Why this is important in terms of the quality of the data? As I said, decision making, because what do we do with the data impact not only in the medical decision, but in aspects of equity. Not only glomerular filtration rate, we have hundreds of examples where we use race correction, which is a practice that we need to uh, start eliminating. We have an example here from um, vaginal birth where depending on the person identifies as Black or Hispanic, they have less chances to retry a uh, vaginal part after a C-section. So given all what we have talked about, the data, specifically in the case of racial inequality, do you think that we can take the data and the data results at face value? What do we think about the policies that we are making? And I like this cartoon because it really explains how many of us have received like this call from Statistics Canada about that survey or about that information that we have to fill? So we need to know about, I mean, to think about these people, about this, how many of these people that received the call will answer the call, how many of the people who received the call will answer the call accurately, and how many of these people that received the call will have a meaningful information. Because we cannot mm, trust too much that data. And because we try to get data in the first place uh, to analyze ethnic inequalities in Latin America. Together with colleagues from Drexel University, the Hawkins uh, University of Toronto, um, we initiated a program to try to assess racial inequalities in the Pan American region. So, this is the beautiful theme of um, Black, Protestant, and Latinos, and, um, or uh, people living in the Pan American region, to collect data, analyze data. We choose three health outcomes, maternal health, uh, cardiovascular health, and vector bone diseases for obvious reasons. Um, we decided to examine the availability, quality, and scope of the data. Why? Because we think that the information or the data cycle is broken and can be broken at any step, from the research question to the use of the information, not only in the analysis, but also in the use of the information. And the question that is here for you is, why data concerns? Because as you see, you provide data, but we collect the data at the same time. We analyze the data and we also interpret the data. And um, among people in, like in this audience, you're trying to use it for decision-making as well. So when we think about the future of inequalities or the future of structural inequalities, looking back, do we really learn this? We really learn something about the data, the structural issues. Um, 
that's for you to answer that question. And what is important is to know the story, know your story. And by that, I mean, know the data. Um, we need to acknowledge that this is an ever evolving context. Um, it's important to know what are you measuring and if the interpretations of those measures are really accurate. And also be mindful of the means and ways that you use to disseminate the data and the implications that they have. A cautionary note, although I'm part of the AR for public health, plat health training platform, it is important to consider and make sure that you are you make a wise use of the methods and technologies and opportunities. The case of AI, um, the cautionary note is to know whether or not we are addressing the inequalities or we are augmenting the inequalities. Always remember what we have in our data is just a pool, it's just a sample of the real world. If we take a skewed sample from what is in the real world, what we put in that data processor, what we will have as a result is also an skewed view of the real world. So the recommendation is just be aware and be transparent. If you haven't started already, start be transparent. Gather the information, make notes, take the minutes of every script that you make in the data collection, data cleaning, data analysis, be open, share the information, and share the information in ways that everyone have access and that everyone have the opportunity to replicate whatever you're doing. Um, if there are no changes, there are no meaningful interventions to address, and therefore there is no future. So I wanted to be more hopeful, but <laughs> uh, I think it's just an invitation, a provocation for for further discussion. So gracias, um, merci beaucoup. Um, thank you. You can. Yeah, you can go sit in the in the chair. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, you get it. <laughs> the Q and A period. I will join you shortly, but make sure that just want to make sure that we get our other speaker on on screen for the folks in the room here. Um, just give me one second. There we go. And this is hidden. And there we go. So folks on Zoom, you see us, all three of us, and we're gonna join in with um, Professor Siddiqui. I think I've got everything right. Sound is good? Folks, okay, great. Um, so opening it up for Q&A, uh, if we have questions in the room, as well as questions um, online. So I'm gonna check to my team here and also online if you have questions, but please jump in. Um, we will have mics circulating. Just recognize some of my viewers. So please let us, uh, don't, don't be shy. We have two speakers here who provided us with really compelling questions. So please join us. I am not about to make this work. Okay, let's jump in. I see Mari. Hi, Mari. Hi, uh, nice to be here. My name is Maria Antonin and I'm from Finland. Uh, I'm a health researcher and I have also studied uh, social determinants of health. And uh, maybe you know that Finland is a kind of, I don't know, maybe special country, because uh, first of all, what I learned that is uh, Finland is probably the most uh, widest country in the world. We uh, are in North America and, and our population is very much white. And um, we also have universal healthcare system, meaning that the client fees are very low or non-existent. And we also have um, uh, universal maternal care, meaning that expecting mothers don't have to pay anything for uh, maternal care or uh, uh, child delivery. 
and also uh, the health care of children is very uh, well uh, organized and it is free for the families. And we also have universal school system, which means that you don't have to pay to go to school. You right. can study up to PhD and you don't have to pay. So that means that uh, the ability to study is dependent on your talent, maybe, and maybe your motivation. I don't know many reasons, but not only your ability to pay. And still we have uh, growing uh, differences in health uh, based on uh, social uh, and uh, economical position. And uh, it is sort of puzzling to us because we think we are um, filling all the gaps and still this is happening. Uh, basically, there are studies uh, showing that children uh, who come from less educated families uh, also are less educated. And people who have less financial resources, uh, they have worse health and those who are uh, in better position. So uh, basically, I don't know what my question is, but uh, this is a comment. And uh, I often think about this when I read uh, research from North America. Uh, and I'm thinking like, how to what extent we have similar social determinants of health or are they partly different? And uh, how, uh, for example, different uh, causes and consequences differ if we compare, uh, for example, US or, well, maybe many US and, uh, for example, Finland. Thank you. That is a profound question. I think getting to the fundamental causes. Uh, Artemis, do you want to get a crack at it? Yes, sure. Yes, very fascinating. Um, there's two ways that I might think about this. One is um, to understand what some of the policies are that haven't been addressed. Um, and I think it requires looking not only at the health literature, but at the uh, you know economics, political science, and sociology literature to see what kinds of factors um, are associated with education and income. So for example, in North America, what we know is that um, it's not just um, it's not just a a question of the fact that poverty and income determine your access to education. It's that, there's sort of a, a reversal in the relationship in the sense that what often matters is not just um, income, but family wealth. And wealth leads to um, intergenerational transfers. And it's those transfers that are mostly paying for uh, um, people's education, for down payments on homes, et cetera. So intergenerational wealth transmission and intergenerational economic security in general may be one type of policy scenario, you know, to think about, but that's just an example. I think the, the bigger issue is just to think about a wide range of policies that may matter for economic security and for opportunity. The second part of that would be to think about the mechanisms um, between uh, policy and outcomes. So, um, or mechanisms between economic conditions and outcomes. So again, you know, the North American example, one thing we know about kids who come from uh, higher income, higher education families is that they often have access to a really rich network of parents, friends, and so on. So many of them are getting internships and reference letters and so on. Uh, in other words, there's a kind of network effect of your income and education that's operating. And that's one way in addition to affordability that um, makes income kind of affect your opportunities. So the other thing I would encourage is just to think about the various mechanisms that may be operating and whether all or some of those mechanisms are addressed by the policies that have been enacted. The deep all the best. To the mechanism. Thank you. Um, ben, did you want to add? Mm -hmm. Just 
short consideration, the, um, the social determinants of health are the same, uh, but they affect populations differently. Again, we go back to context. A context have a geography, have a population, have dynamics and mechanistic aspects. Um, there is Sandra Galea also his uh, encouraging thinking about not only social determinants of health, but there are all the determinants of health, like commercial, political determinants of health that may interact with those social determinants of health to have different outcomes in your specific population. Does that sure not be? And they will also structure how these are expressed. Like we know you're also the happiest country on earth. So we need something like that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we do have a question here from um, the chat. So I'll read it out from Lisa Garland here, one of our partners at uh, Veterans Affairs Canada. Um, thank you both for your compelling presentations, Dr. Siddiqui and Caraballi. Dr. Caraballi, can you speak to the research methods approaches that you suggest are most appropriate for intersectional research, specifically for your understanding for understanding the impact that multiple identities, as you pointed out, for regarding your identity, may have on health and well-being in Africans. I have to apologize if I extend too much because this is a topic that I really like. <laughs> I don't like to go over to extent. This is what I do. Um, there are different ways. You know, the first thing is as I say, your data, your sample, make sure you have enough data or sufficient data to answer your research question. Then um, you have simple methods, and then you have simple methods like a stratification, right? You could do your analysis just using simple stratification. Let's start by simple ways. Scripted, and then you build up. Scripted um, stratification. After stratification, then you get to use interactions with that. you measure effect measure modification as a simple approach. Having uh, effect measure modification, you need to make sure that your sample is enough to detect an interacting effect. We are very quick to just put interaction terms over interaction terms over interaction terms. And we need four times sample size to identify an interacting effect uh, that for a regular association. So if you're thinking about your medicine association is 1.5, so to find an interaction that is meaningful of 1.5, you need four times that sample size. Uh, that's something that is not uh, taught to everyone. I say I apologize because this is my case, I bet. <laughs> then after that, um, after the interaction and, and the the stratification, you get to you get to more sophisticated things. And I always recommend use measures of inequality. All ratios are not measures of inequality. If you want to work with inequalities, use risk ratios, risk differences appropriately. Uh, but those still are no measures of inequality. They are just measures of associations and differences. So go to um, distributional assessment, go to relative concentration index of inequalities, go to inequalities at the extreme. And then for the intersecting identities, so you try to contrast. There is a novel method um, pioneered by John Merlo and Claire Evans. It's called the Mahida, which is a multi-level approach. Pretty much, you first need to have this research question enough sample size. And then you start adding some interactions at different levels. This method basically proposes that we are individuals embedded in societies or embedded in groups. So the lower level is the individual, and then you belong to groups, groups of education, group of socioeconomic status, group of gender or sex, and then you start building up a hierarchical model. This is a novel method, and it has a lot of detractors from the statistical point of view because there are some issues of convergence. But if you are like me, you work um, on the patient framework, everything is more flexible. So you can overcome some of the issues with the convergence and, and statistical issues by using the kind of more sophisticated methods. Um, in addition, just be mindful of the methods. So as I say, I'm very enthusiastic of the methods, but you need to know when to use it and how to use it. 
It doesn't matter if you use the most sophisticated methods, if your data set and these expressions are not meaningful, it doesn't matter. So I, I will always say go back to the basics. I'd like to actually pose a question to both of you. Yeah, director's privilege there. Uh, jumping in. Um, I, you, so you, ex and I'm taking notes because I know this is going to circle back to me with my graduate students being like, oh, now we need to use that method, right? <laughs> and so um, the question then that I will like to pose to you and expand on what you just said, like be mindful of when to use them is also bringing it back to when you're supporting decision making. When, um, how do you draw the line between the different methods that you're going to use and where, where, you know, how, how do you make those decisions? And I'm going to ask that to you, Ravel, and also to Arjun from your experiences. Um, audience is key. I mean, research question is key, but the audience is also, the audience is also key. Um, I moved, um, I would say I'm fluent <laughs> to academia and um, apply research and decision making. So even though if I apply my most robust model, um, I will try to convey the message in the best way for the decision making in the more meaningful way, you know, like even if it just means to translate 30 pages of coding into a box plot, then I will do that just for the sake of it conveying the message. I would say the, the line into where to go is like, we cannot ask the data to give more than what it could. Um, sometimes we want to do a lot and trying to understand that, but we cannot squeeze that data until that is nothing else left. So I will always say same, go back to your research question, see the data is enough, start by simple, build up. If you see that there is nothing changing and then that it could not get anything, that it will not change the number of people that you will, uh, that then we prevent an outcome from happening by, you know, intervening. So there is no point in, con in continuing. Um, the other thing is the quality. Quality of the data. Say, say you have 100 people, but you have perfect data, use it. Because if you have 100 people, but 30% have Missing key information, then there is no point in going for it. Thank you for that. Um, Arjun? Yeah, yeah, I really agree with Mabel's um, uh, answer. Maybe I'll just add a couple of things. One, um, I often think about what the audience might be questioning. So it's the audience in terms of your message, and then it's the audience in terms of um, what questions or doubts they might have and whether you can um, deal with those doubts in your in your um, analyses. So you preempt um, what they might be thinking um, in the methods that you use. And in fact, I think this is often how new methods are developed, their responses to um, some inadequacy. Um, but the second part of that is making sure you're still getting a hold of the inference that you're making. Because one thing that changes with methods um, is, is at least sometimes not just how rigorous they are, but what inference they're um, enabling you to make. Um, I'll, I'll give you a quick example of a policy environment where this happened to us. We did a study commissioned by the Ontario Ministry of community and social services. And our job was to understand the health effects of Ontario's income assistance program. And we used propensity score analysis where we basically compared the health of people on income assistance to the health of people similar who are not on income assistance so we could isolate the effect of income assistance but that their other characteristics were very similar. So we're not comparing the health of income assistance, uh, people on income assistance to the general population who would have many other than confounding and selection bias factors by virtue of different lives that happen because of different income levels and education levels and so on. 
So we did this study and we presented it and uh, we got to the meeting and this woman from one of the ministries that was there said, you know, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, we know from, from seeing uh, people who are on income assistance that they're not doing well, uh, but it's really nice to have some numbers attached to it. And I thought to myself, I'm not telling you that they're doing worse than the general population or they appear to be doing badly. I'm telling you that they're doing worse than people who are similarly socioeconomically situated, meaning at the margin, increased um, income from your policy is not helping at the margin. That's a very different inference than are they doing worse than high income people. So I, I try to be mindful of the inference that's happening with the method that I'm using and if it's shifting as I cycle through many different methods. Thank you. Um, yeah, going down into nuance is definitely important, but also challenging. Um, so we have two questions in the audience and one follow-up um, online and about 10 minutes to go. So I may move on to make sure that we can cover everything. Yeah. Hi, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the very interesting yeah, presentation. So my question is for both of the presenters. And it's kind of like a philosophical question and it goes to this idea that maybe we are trying to solve everything using the same framework, right? That is the statistic. But what if we move to a different way of thinking? Like for example, using engine-based models or uh, simulations and trying to um, change the way we are understanding the, the data because right now I feel everything is empirical, but what about the theory? Are we still interested in that? Maybe we should start um, using simulations to check the counterfactual and actually come to some kind of understanding of what would happen if we do this and have something more, yeah, that could be used for policy making. Yeah. Can you just also finish by giving the uh, mic? Yeah. Okay, my name is Sophia. I'm a postdoc at TU Delft in the Netherlands. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. I know who you are there. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love those comments. And I didn't get to show my shameless plug, but Arjuman and I are editing a special collection on methods for social improvement. One of the things that we are encouraging them is going back to theory, right? Yes, we do a lot of empirical work, but why about the theory? And I am an enthusiast of simulations because there is no other way to waste them. You know, you don't have the data. So since you don't have the data, a better way to know, okay, this theory works to a simulation. How much data do you need to get the information at the accuracy level that you need to do a simulation? Um, you mentioned um, agent-based model as an infectious diseases. I'm trying to apply everything that we do on infectious diseases modeling into uh, social epidemiology and together we have to look at this global population and global health. We have um, uh, ideas of using um, simulations for policy intervention. What will happen if I um, intervene X or Y? Um, so I really love your, your approach. I think that it's nothing, it's not something that is forgotten, but it's not something that we have as a people, you know, are something not think that we use constantly. So I agree we need more innovation. Um, but I still say we need to be mindful of the methods and what are the materials that we have when, when we use those this information. Um I will just because it's related about yeah, it's related to the question that we have in, in, in the chat is um, the use of mixed methods, so together with theory and together with the qualitative research. A number by itself doesn't mean anything. We need explanation. Um, and I will share the experience that I have with my PhD student. She's defending actually this month. Um, we use, we evaluate Food access to food donations and food insecurity in Quebec. We have a cohort of 100, 1,000 individuals um, that were the noble uh, food bank users. 
Um, but as you know, it's like the outcome is complex and the interventions were very complex. So we use longitudinal, longitudinal targeted vaccine and likelihood estimation, super sophisticated methods, and etc. So we find and identify the trajectories of use. And we try to estimate the effect of using different like community-based services into change the food security status. And it's beautiful, and we get the numbers and everything. But we still have the, the need to know who are these people? Why they end up needing a system to improve the food security in the first place? How or why people change or move from you know chronic users to intermittent users or you know acute users? Who are these people? So luckily we have a team of uh, qualitative researchers that they say we respect them because they get information that we cannot get out of the numbers. So the integration of theory and critical analysis from the quantitative point of view. And qualitative research is a must if we want to move forward. Otherwise, we are we will still be at the point of asking the same questions, getting the same answers, and not doing anything with them. Thank you, uh, Arjuman. Did you want to add? I think it's a PM question. Yeah, no, just uh, so I, I fully support uh, what Mabel is saying, and it's a great question. I would add it may also be worth us thinking about our theory of causal inference, that we um, that we accept a certain theory that's very prominent in social epi, and it's a question of whether we think that theory will enable us to understand what's happening in the world. And it's not that that theory isn't useful, that counterfactual approaches aren't useful. And as I say, that isolating effects aren't useful. My worry is though, that if we constrain our theory of causation in that way, there are so many large questions about the way the world works that we will miss or uh, not sort of appropriately represent in our research. So. To me, that's it's it's theory about how the world works, but it's also our theory of um, what's on the table as a cause, what's on the table as a question, um, and, and how that depends on what we accept as methods. Thank you. So we will take one last question in because Mabel answered the question from Lisa about mixed methods online, but please go ahead and introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Um, with presentation, I enjoyed it. My name is Ogoj Konyasan from University of Leverage. Um, I'm a student of uh, quantitative methods and I want to ask the first presenter about the sample size. I don't want to use the term undersampling or oversampling. Let me use small and large sample. And um, I know some softwares are promising that you can calculate adequate sample size based on the exact statistical tool you're using and the nature of the variable. My question is, are those um, calculations actually helpful in having an adequate input, adequate sample size? The second one is when you were answering another question, you mentioned about complex models having like should have like sample size, like four times the sample sizes of our simple models. And you also advocated for beauty from simple to complex models. Mm -hmm. So the question now is, the same sample size may not fit all the statistical tools. It might be um, over fitting for small, small uh, for simple models, and uh, maybe appropriate for you know more complex models. So in the same research, where I want to use simple models and build to complex model, how do I handle a big sample size if they are going to be overfitting from where I want to start? Then the last one, um, just kind of say, even when those models are well fitted and well sampling is well done, some of these are still based on statistical um, theories and the fact that might account for the fact for like a larger population, like the fact for the larger proportion of this sample, 
doesn't really mean that in my account or the fact for everybody in the sample. So even though the other uh, percentage they are not accounting for are very small, they may still be meaningful and they will still we, we need to have that at the back of our mind. Finally, the first presenter, I wanted to know how you how you handle minorities in a model where the minorities are actually kind of a very small proportion of the overall sample size, like two percent. How you want to handle minorities and intersectionality in those models? Okay, thank you for those questions. So, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask um, Archibald to start and maybe. If you can give a quick answer and then turn to Mabel, and I know the answer probably will not do justice to the complexity of your question, but we have lunch right afterwards, so I do encourage you to uh, join up with our speakers. Sorry, putting you up on the spot over lunch. Um, after she's had a bite. Um, <laughs> okay, Martina. Uh, yeah, so thanks very much. I'm going to just uh, hand it over to Mabel just to say that the initial question of whether it's helpful. I think it's helpful to the extent that the assumptions built into the um, sample size calculations actually reflect your reality. Um, and then there's a disciplinary difference. So when you talk to economists, they have no concept of sample size calculations. I've done grant writing with them, and that's not sort of a strategy they use. And actually, a lot of social epidemiologists, at least um, from back in the day, did not either. So um, some of it is is just disciplinary differences, but I think to the extent it's helpful, it's related to whether the assumptions make sense. And again, Kanan has a paper and an opinion piece in social epidemiology, I guess I don't know if he calls himself social, we consider him a little bit social, um, where he says that both sides or power calculations shouldn't be the be all and all of studies. Um, because we need to put those studies out and let the meta-analyses give us the more precise answer. Take that out there. Uh, three lines. First, um, precision, no power calculation. Couple that. Precision, no, 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 no power calculation. Um, second, I will refer to the cartoon about the question. Yeah, qualitative, quantitative, what do we do? So, um, then for uh, assumption, calculate first. Not everything has to be answered under the umbrella of the calculate first, because not everything could be answered under the umbrella of calculate first, because we don't make the assumptions all the time. Um, the last, all models are wrong. So, I useful. I think I didn't say that it's a famous bad statistician who <laughs> said indeed. I think that's a quotable quote and it's the right one to end on. You gave yeah. both of you gave us so much food for thought. Um, such you give us deep dives and big picture stories. Um, thank you so very much. I know the conversations will be really fed by uh, over lunch and it's unfortunately you, you can't join us uh, argument but we will make it up for sure when it's a better time um and so i just want to thank you both immensely and i know folks here will join me in doing so um,